Perfect. Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar brought to you by King's Health Partners and the Diabetes Psychiatry and Psychology Department at King's College London. Today's topic is insulin and weight. Before we begin, we would like to remind everyone of our usual housekeeping rules. We keep our participants' video cameras and microphones off to make sure that we have a good internet connection. However, we would like to encourage your participation through the chat function. Time will be given at the end of the session to answer any questions. My name is Emma. Um, I am a PhD student at King's College London, working on eating disorders in type 1 diabetes. We, uh, the session will also be led by Professor Kalida Ismail. Would you like to introduce yourself, Kalida? Yeah, thank you, Emma. Yeah, my name is Kalida Ismail. I'm a diabetes psychiatrist based at uh, King's Health Partners, which is an umbrella organization of uh, three hospitals, King's College Hospital, Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, South London and Maudsley Trust, and the University King's College London. And Natalie? Hello, I'm Natalie Zaremba, and I'm a researcher for the study project in type one diabetes and eating disorders at King's. Um, and I'll be chatting with you today in the chat function and collecting questions to ask our guests at the end. Um, if you'd like to send me a message privately, you can click my name in the chat function and I'll respond to you privately as well. Thank you. And Lauren and Marietta, would you like to introduce yourselves as well? I feel like I'm on University Challenge. Um, hello, I'm Lawrence. Uh, I'm uh, one of the speakers today. I'm a type 1 diabetic and I also have a history of eating disorders. Hello, I'm Marietta Stadler. I'm an energy recognition scientist and that means I'm both a diabetes doctor and a diabetes researcher at King's. Great. Okay, Emma. Have you frozen? We can ad lib. Yeah. Yes. So um, perhaps if I start then, thanks, and I think we, we might have frozen you or you, the system's frozen. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, just to give you a little bit of, of a background to what the purpose of these webinars are. These are an online interactive forum for people with diabetes to talk about the psychological aspects of diabetes, especially uh, during this COVID-19 um, pandemic, but hopefully uh, also beyond. Um, this is not a clinical service, so if you have any urgent diabetes or mental health questions, please contact your GP or your diabetes team and they will be there um, ready to help you. So the format is that I interview a person with diabetes first and then followed by a diabetes health professional uh, to find out a little bit about the psychological aspects of diabetes from their perspective. And then there'll be a uh, opportunity for you to ask questions through the chat function, which we'll give back to our speakers. Um, and then finally, um, Natalie or and Emma will be presenting a summary of toolkits that we devise every week that's completely new that you can go in and look at during the week and think about if this helps you with your diabetes. So I'd like to start um, and just to remind everybody that you will get better functionality and we will hear about you in the background um, if you keep your video function and your audio off. Um, so thank you. So I'll start with you, Lawrence. Thank you again for joining and it's really no lovely to meet you. Um, perhaps if I start by asking you a little bit about yourself, you know, like your age, what do you do for a living, where do you live and so on. Absolutely. So um, I'm Lawrence. Um, I'm an actor. So when I say I'm 28, that's usually a lie, but I actually am 28. Um, but I can play, you know, um, uh, I'm Scottish. Uh, so I was born in the Highlands uh, in, up in Inverness and I lived there for about 10 years. And then I moved to Stirling, uh, which is a city between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And I studied in Glasgow for four years and then I've moved down to London. So I've been in London for about six years now or so. Okay. Great. And uh, um, be interested to find out a little bit more about your acting, but tell us about your diabetes. When were you diagnosed with diabetes? How old were you? Um, I was diagnosed um, when I was about three years old. Mm -hmm. um, so my maternal grandfather, so uh, I don't know, uh, uh, he was a type 1 diabetic as well. So I think when I started to dis display symptoms, mum and dad kind of very quickly knew, oh, here we go. 
and then about six months after I was diagnosed, um, my older brother, he was then diagnosed as well. So um, we keep it in the family. Right. So how old is he? How old was he when he developed it? He, um, he's, uh, he, so I was three, he was five. Right. Okay. And for some reason I had it first and then, then he got it six yeah. months later. So. Tell me, I know it might sound like a strange question, but what is your first memory of, of having diabetes? You know, what's your first memory of having diabetes? It's a funny one because uh, what I was saying to Emma before in, in a previous conversation is that it's almost like what was my first memory of having blue eyes? It's, for me, it's so ingrained with my yeah. identity. It's, it's, it is absolutely part of, of, mm -hmm. of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, there, there's slight glimmers of, I remember uh, one time when we had to, to practice with, because thankfully now our syringes are, are, are minuscule, you know, six mm -hmm. millimetres, but they used to be quite... Um, chunky, chunky things, um, in, especially in the early 90s. So there was a, I remember a time that my parents and I were practicing with injections, big syringes on oranges and trying to, you know, pierce the, the skin of an orange because that's similar to piercing the skin uh, of yourself. And um, so a, a slight memory is, you know, having to inject um, yeah. produce, um, which is, you know, and then uh, well, another... Uh, well, do you have an idea of what the emotion was around that. Was it fun? Was it frightening? Was it weird? Was it, am I different to other kids? I think it was entire, I think it was absolutely normalized. And I think especially that was compounded by the fact that my brother had it as well. Mm. You know, the, the, the other child in the house or the other child who I'd see the majority of my time with at home and because we went to the same school, I saw another child with diabetes. And my parent, there, there's no, um, there's no secrecy around the disease. There's no nothing like that. So it became incredibly normalised, um, almost to the point that I kind of assumed everyone had diabetes in a way. Um, uh, and actually, I was um, saying to Emma as well that in my primary school in the north of Scotland, there's about 100 kids, but about seven of them had type one diabetes. Oh, okay. So. Um, if mom is watching, she thinks there's a conspiracy theory to do with Chernobyl. She thinks the radiation clouds have some, yeah. somehow irradiated yeah. um, uh, Scottish waters. But anyway, um, so yeah, so so it was it was it was normalised. So I don't think um, I mean, as we'll come to later, I don't think there's any um, genuine feelings of angst or uh, any any not any negative uh, connotations to my diabetes that I could I could actually identify at I think that in your life. At, yeah. at that age at that age and stage I think I was you know I was a, a child I, I was experiencing the world let alone my diabetes yeah. so I think it was only as I started to mature that I started to kind of go oh hang on maybe my experiences are slightly different from others as a result of this disease I have whereas before I just kind of yeah. took, just went with it I'll come back to that actually, just what you've just said, but I just want to pick up the point about your mom and conspiracy theories. Let's not completely- Sorry, mom. Because, <laughs> because actually there are pockets around the world of high, high prevalence of type one diabetes, aren't there? Like Sicily, which has got an unusual number of people with type one diabetes. So I'm not saying that there's a conspiracy theory, but I think there are these pockets um, around the world. So I think, you know, it's great that your mom's thinking about it. So going back to your, you said something at the beginning, you know, about it's when I first remembered my blue eyes is almost the same as when I remember I have diabetes. And you said it's so part and parcel of me. Mm. And I think there, therein lies the question about your psychology, doesn't it? Your personality, in what way did you Develop. You said it was quite normalised at first, but and then you became aware that you were a bit different and you had something different. So what was that emotional experience like when you became more aware that that perhaps it's not, you know, not every family has somebody with diabetes? Yeah, I think I think that it probably would have absolutely come at a time of of, of adolescence in 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 regards to. Uh, growing up in, in, and, and becoming a functioning adult in the world and having to con contend with, with the disease as well. I think from such an early age, everything was so regimented and controlled because it had to be. So, um, you know, every, every meal was monitored and my bloods were monitored. And, and so there was, a, there was a very much an open dialogue between myself and, and my family. But there was also a lot of, I, I gave over a lot of um, my own agency as a 
members, the functioning member of society. Yes, I was a child, but I gave a lot of that and control over to my family and to my parents. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I wasn't quite sure about my diabetes, mum and dad will know. And maybe if, oh, if I forgot to do my, my injections, mum and dad will remember. So I kind of I give a lot over to them, but then the flip side of that is then because there's so much uh, focus on um, my neighbours have just started doing DIY, which is fantastic. Um, because there's so much focus on control that maybe a flip side of that is then there's a lot of anxiety. Mm. Even if I couldn't actually name it, as I say at the time, the, the reason there is so much is control is because the other side of that is something could go wrong. So I think there's, there's whether or not I was completely cognizant of it, there was, I was constantly walking a, a tightrope of the reason this is happening is because that could happen and kind of um, keeping that particular wolf at the door, um, it grinds you down. Um, yeah. and, and, and as a child, I don't think I was, I was aware of that, but as I've, as I've um, taken on my own uh, management of my diabetes and there's, it's not up to a parent, parental figure or a health team, it, it's, it's my diabetes, that means that the the rewards are due to my own um, making, but also so so the faults and and that um, that 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 carries quite a lot of weight to it. So, you know, I think that point that you make about the control, the other side of the coin of the control, is a huge amount of fear, isn't it? Is yeah. what you you know, if things go wrong, if you just lost a minute of control, or if things go wrong it then can go quite badly wrong. And what would be your fears? What would be at the back of your mind of things going wrong that's sort of constantly percolating at the back of your mind? If, if I well, felt tight row, what would that look like? What were well, your what's interesting is, and as I said this to Emma before, is that growing up and as, as a child, it was very much, it was, I had the fear of the immediate repercussions. So if I took too much insulin or if I didn't eat enough, the immediate thing would be I would have a hypo and that, that sucks, you know, that's rubbish. I don't like having a hypo because it doesn't feel nice. Yeah. And you know, the other flip side of that is, oh, I didn't have enough insulin or ate too much, then my mm. sugars are high. Oh, well, ugh, I don't feel as bad when I'm high as I do when I'm hypo. When I'm having a hypo, the blood sugars are low. That's a scary, scary feeling because you feel very out of control. Whereas a high, you get a bit lethargic and a bit thirsty. Oh, well. And that's what I thought growing up, but it's only as I was, as I've gotten older and as I've grown up with my diabetes, now realizing that actually the high levels can be just as dangerous as the low in terms of um, long-term health. So I think ask any eight-year-old, hey, what do you think you're gonna be like when you're 70? They wouldn't have a clue. So I, I didn't have, a, I didn't have any um, awareness of cause and effect of actually the actions I take today could affect me later on, later on down the line. So I think as I became more aware of that, that then added on to the anxiety of my, my misbehaviors right now can actually have a very long-term effect on me. And, and, and I, 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 still, I still grapple with that. It, it can be, it can be quite, a, quite a intimidating feeling. So you said that when you were approaching adolescence, are you talking about 12, 13, 14 or 15, 16, 17? I mean, I think, well, yeah, I think 15, 16, 17, um, that's when things really, that's yeah. when the wheels came right off that cart. Um, a little bit more about that. Sure, um, boy, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a dumpster fire for anyone, um, teen, teenagedom. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, the way I, I likened it is that um, I had multiple plates spinning at the one time. And if I had the time and the resources and the allocation to, to just deal with um, one of the plates, then maybe I, maybe I could have dealt with that. But because they're all spinning at once, they all fell at once. And that can be um, uh, pressure of, of um, wanting to achieve good grades and bits and bobs mm -hmm. like that. But achieving good grades means you get into a university, which means you get a job, which means you're set up with you. There was a case of I was having to grow up and think ahead of my immediate now position and having to think of the future. And I think I started to really worry about the future and worry about what that would entail for me. So something I did was I would I then effectively made myself ill to stunt any development, because if I made myself ill now, then 
everyone else can kind of gather around me and, and, and hold me and cuddle me and, and keep me here, keep me safe. Whereas if I'm left to my own devices, that could that that's dangerous. And yeah. um, and um, my uh, the grandfather I mentioned who had diabetes, he uh, sadly passed away, um, and um, that was very traumatic. Um, and um, uh, my my brother is now a doctor, and um, probably just a passing comment, but I remember asking him about, it's along the lines of, of my, my grandfather's case, it wasn't directly related to diabetes, but he said the thing is when they're having to triage the patients and look at different things, they'd have seen 70 year old ex-smoker type 1 diabetic. Mm -hmm. And I'd never really considered that actually my diabetes could be something that um, not not prevents me from getting extra help but it just it it, it loaded it loaded the diabetes with, with extra meaning and 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 so that was tricky and then issues with my sexuality which I wasn't um entirely aware of or confident with at the time which um um they've been resolved I am very much a homosexual um but so um uh, but at the time it was very challenging to, to, to deal with um so i think a lot of things were happening at once yeah. and and yeah it, I, I struggled you're absolutely, you're absolutely right there were a lot of plates spinning yeah. and you know i'm really struck by the point you made that i have come across in my work with people with diabetes is something really powerful that you said about I have to face, I'm, like every teenager, I'm thinking about the future, you know, great A-levels, university, careers, family, so on, mortgages. And I think what, and it also, I think what you didn't quite say, but I think that's what you mean, is it also meant leaving home. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? Part of all of that meant leaving home, and that meant leaving the safety that your parents provided you with, because you've said several times um, how, if I wasn't, you know, there was always somebody else back, uh, somebody else backing me up. So if I had forgotten, my parents would step in. If I didn't want to do something, my parents did it for me. And I think that allowed your childhood to develop and nourish and you were well nurtured. And then all of yeah. a sudden at the age of 15, 16, you've got to now stop separate from all of that. And I think it induced some separation, significant separation anxiety which you then converted into, I tell you what, I'm not gonna look after my diabetes so I can stay ill or a child. And I don't mm. need to leave home and face this future because I think with diabetes and the future issues you have to face, it became too much, isn't it? Like a double burden. I mean, what do you think about that sort of explanation? You know, it is, I've, I've never, I've, I haven't considered that. Um... My mum will be like, I told you. Um, <laughs> um, but no, it, it's true. It, it's the. What did she tell you? What, what, did, what did she used to say? Oh, no, she, she likes to. I'll tell you off the air. Um, but no, but, and I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's true. It, was the, it would be uh, um, the safety net. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and even in the case of. So this was at a time when actually all the way through, all the way through my primary school and all the way through my high school, my brother was always two years ahead of me. So he was always, if anything went wrong with my diabetes, I would ask the teacher, like, is it okay if I go check with my brother? And so I could just like nip down, like not yeah. knock on like his chemistry lesson, like, sorry. Yeah. And I'd ask him, but then he then went off to university to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was suddenly uh, alone. So that, that kind of hit at the same time as well as the same time as having to do exams mm -hmm. and bits and bobs like that. So I think it was a case of like, okay, grow up now, go. And I think I just, in that fight or flight um, moment, I, I... And I think that is not very well recognised, I think, the anxiety that, pe the, you know, people think it's just about growing up, but I think it's about separating from your loved ones in the context of your diabetes that I think young people find very stressful. So what were the consequences for you? You said, you know, all of these balls in the air. Um, what, what did you stop doing? Well, yes, um, uh, I, it, was, it was very much a case of, it felt that ev everything was out of control at that time. Everything felt chaotic mm -hmm. in that moment, but the one thing I could control was the diabetes. Um, what my brother once said was, you, you knew the rules of the game so well, you knew how to cheat. Um, right. yeah. Just because it had always been a constant, the, there's always the diabetes was always there. And um, I think 
I'd started to exercise a lot more um, just as a, I was becoming a teenager. So I was, I wasn't sporty whatsoever. Um, um, really comically bad at sport. Um, and uh, uh, so I started to run a wee bit more, but what I was finding was that um, I would do a run and then my sugar levels would drop and then I'd have a hypo. So then I'd just have to eat or in, in, ingest sugars to then counteract the hypo. But then I was like, well, but then that means that any weight that I just lost by doing the run, I've just put back on again with, because of the hypo. That's annoying. So then I was like, okay, and then. Was well, that, well, sorry to interrupt you, was that because you would overtreat the hypo? I mean, yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah. Um, lizard brain would activate and go gobble, gobble, gobble. Um, I just said that. Um, uh, yeah, so I would over, I would overtreat the hypo. Um, so then, what I would do is like, well, if if I don't lower my blood sugars um, to like normal range and then have a hypo, so what I should do is just maybe make my sugars a little bit high, so that when I do drop because of the hypo, they drop into normal range rather from rather than from normal range into a hypo. And then I would just eventually just eventually just stop taking my insulin, um, but then continue with um uh excessive exercise um and um and i find that 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 yeah so the, this, it made me um i just think i i felt at that time incredibly numb um numbed by um by by circumstances um i, I with my control so i think this made me feel something it made it it, even though it made me feel horrific um, in terms of my blood sugar levels running so high for so long, it made me feel um, very uh, connected to something and it made me feel connected to my body, my physical self. I could feel my heart pounding, I could feel um, my fingertips burning and I could, I could feel something and even though there are negative things I was feeling, at least I was feeling something at a time when I felt so, so numb. Um, Due, due, due to circumstances. Are, are you saying that the high blood sugars had numbed you sort of from a mental point of view, but it was giving you these physical symptoms like the numbness feelings in your fingers, the palpitations, and actually that 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 counteracted the mental numbness. So so hmm. you said um you're saying that that actually it was the sort of, you know, being a teenager, my body image was important. There were other things going on, like my sexuality, my brother leaving home, me having to become more independent and that you sort of almost like almost like intuitively stopped taking the insulin in a way didn't you sort of, sort of gradually sort of cut it down and you found yourself in this new position and you but you don't mention you said mentioned at the beginning that you had an eating disorder plastic but you don't mention the impact on what you thought about your body what you know the connection between giving up insulin and suddenly noticing you know kilograms falling off yeah, I think because at the time I didn't know I had an eating disorder. Right. right. I think very, it was a very much a case of there was there was a, a girl in my year uh, at high school who I knew had an eating disorder, and the stories I knew about her very very sad, very tragic. But she'd been an inpatient and she'd been hospitalised, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, I've not been hospitalised, so I don't have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I thought that that you could only qualify for an eating disorder if you'd hit rock bottom. And for me, I was like, well, I haven't hit rock bottom, so. And also eating disorders are what girls get. Um, and I, you know, I was still eating as well. Um, um, but I was still losing, losing the weight. So it, it was just an incredibly confusing time. And, and, and yeah, I think it wasn't until a health practitioner said, I think you have an eating disorder. Then I was like, oh, well, this makes sense. Um, so yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, I was very confused. Quite mentioned your body image like <laughs> did you you know like did you think that the insulin was making you put on weight one of the key features of eating disorders the way we understand it in diabetes is that people think that insulin puts on weight yeah. and and, the, and that belief is so strong that they'd rather not take it for some people who've got eating disorder mm. so that did that happen to you no, and so so I, I um, but it's incredibly, it's it's interesting that I almost had, uh, almost like an opposite reaction. It was it was there was no case of I didn't see in any way, I didn't see insulin as the enemy. Mm. 
I found that actually insulin was a great cheat in a way. It was kind of like, great, if I don't take it, then I lose weight. So it almost, I try, I think what I was trying to do was weaponize my diabetes mm-hmm. and, kind of go, and, and kind of go, well, do you know what? It sucks that I've got this. It really sucks. It's so unfair, X, Y, Z. The least I can do with it is use it for my own personal advantage. Diabetes at the time, diabetes isn't giving me anything, so I might as well just take from it. Wow. Um, so there's there's no there's no there, yeah there wasn't a case of 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 insulin putting weight on. It was a case yeah. of actually the, the 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 lack of insulin leads to weight loss. Was was the way I, I very much very much viewed it. Yeah, it's really it is really. I don't think I've heard that particular sentence before I've heard lots of sentences and that one about you know diabetes isn't giving me anything but here is one thing it could give me that's in my power so it's a really powerful point I think what you're also saying is is that eating disorders in a diabetes context isn't quite the same as that girl that you talked about who had to be Mm -hmm. hospitalized because it's mixed up with really anger towards getting diabetes isn't it you're 15 16 you've you've got abstract thought now you know you've got it for the rest of your life you know when you're eight yeah the rest of your life is tomorrow <laughs> yes yeah. yeah but now it's it's mortgages and it's 70 80 years old and the resentment that you must have felt and the sadness that you must have felt yeah so i think the eating disorders is really mixed in with the fact that you don't like having diabetes yeah is, yeah, that is, yeah you know, absolutely um the, yeah resentment i think was quite a big mm. um there was one time i was having to do it i knew i was having a hypo so i was doing a blood test in my class and i had such a bad reaction to that i was hypo that i picked up my, my testing kit and started to throw it across the room and i must stress i was an incredibly well-behaved child <laughs> um, um teacher's mm. pet um so for me to act out in such a way and i remember the teacher was trying to give the lesson about i don't know the jacobites and having to be like and sorry lawrence can you stop doing that um yeah. i was just having such an emotional reaction to this bloody thing and and i was just right. growing and i think i was that if i'm to analyze that i was trying to physicalize my anger by taking it out on yeah and he it. but but so I think what I eventually started to do was to take out that anger and that physicalization on mm-hmm. on myself um because it's in me the diabetes is, is within me as well um yeah I mean do you think I'm just thinking out loud with what you just said and mm-hmm. you've given me a thought which is you know that you had it all your life from the age of three and you do describe being very well supported um and that you had a grandfather that also had diabetes do you think like from a learning point of view for both parents, but also health professionals and teachers and for people with diabetes, do you think there is something to be said about um, that perhaps even as a child, you should be given a little bit of more of psychological awareness of what to expect as you approach ad- adolescence? Or because it comes as a shock to you, doesn't it? I mean, I've heard that story so many times that the sudden awareness causes so much damage because you end up rejecting. Do you think there should be more support for parents and how to talk to young people with diabetes? You know, you've got this for life and... I, 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 yeah, I wonder, I wonder. I mean, I, I have to obviously um, stipulate that I was diagnosed in the Highlands of Scotland in the early 90s. So, I mean, I was first diagnosed with mild diabetes. Mm. Um, just because the, the understanding, it, the, it was still in it, in its relative infancy, um, so I can't comment too much on on my particular. And maybe the doctor also kind of went, "Oh well, your family has it, so you kind of know already." So maybe we weren't told. And I think if if there is a discussion about long lasting, it has to be treated so carefully because for the pair, I, I um, can't imagine. You know, if my child was was to have this, if It'd be, I don't know, you just ha- you'd have to, I think, approach the conversation incredibly carefully because the parents just heard, oh, your child has a disease. You know, they're probably not going to hear everything that, that you're telling them. Um, but I have to say that um, I went to a diabetic appointment recently and the first question was, how are you? I was like, uh, yeah, fine. I mean, it's a bit warm today, so I'm a bit sweaty. But he went, no, 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 like, how are you? How, how are you feeling? 
like emotionally he's like we know we were we're starting to understand that there's quite a lot of baggage and I was like oh my goodness uh, it, it was it was huge um and kind of the 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 validation that gave me from from a professional going just checking in like how are you because this is a big deal because I think there's a lot of um I don't want to put uh, sometimes I feel a bit of guilt um in terms of diabetes and eating disorders as well it's like well it could be a lot worse mm. you know it's not you know I've got all my limbs I've got I can still function in society I can still I'm able-bodied I can do, do all these things so ugh, should I really complain so much about this thing and 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 I think it, it's it's so it's so powerful when when someone can recognize it within you that the thing there's actually quite a lot of there's a lot going on under there and um, still waters run running deep in so. just say that that's a fantastic top tip for any health professional that's listening um and what to say to somebody with diabetes as your opening line it's lovely isn't it how are you no 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 how are you, no, how are you? So, i'm just aware of, of your time and and we've got to bring marietta in as well tell us a bit about how you overcame because Sure. So how what what helped and I I I I, I, ugh, I think I needed to um uh I needed to oh god this sounds terrible but get in touch with the real me I think I don't know I think I I so much of my identity became enmeshed with my diabetes and my eating disorder um uh and and I couldn't quite see who Lawrence was amongst all of that. Um, so I was entering recovery um, via, it was actually my, my, my diabetic health specialist. Um, she noticed that my HbA1c was rocketing and she was like, what, like, this is so bizarre. And I was like, I know exactly why, but I'm not gonna tell you why. And then she suggested I go on a meal plan. And I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely fine. Sure, sure, sure. Knowing full well, I wasn't gonna to commit to that. And then when the next time I saw her, she's like, so how, you know, let, let's check out your meal plan. I went, I'm not eating. And I just kind of burst, blurted it out. And she was fantastic. And she got me signed up with child med mental, child and adolescent mm -hmm. mental health services um, and got that ball rolling. But I have to say that my initial uh, diagnosis of an eating disorder um, was when I was, say, like 16 and I'm now 28 and I'm still feeling the effects of it. And I, I was entering um, plenty of, of, of care, uh, NHS and, and, and a bit of pri private um, inpatient uh, care as well. Um, Eating disorders unit? Yep, yeah, uh, 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 it was a, a, a primary hospital. What, um, so there was that first initial health professional that, that recognised and supported you through the initial phase, but what treatments do you think helped you over time or are still helping you? Well, what was what was interesting was that it was very much and and I and I, I can't blame them. You know, the the, the, the uh, medical professionals when I'd first meet them, they would have to essentially triage my uh, my my um, various ailments. So they would see, oh, he's got an eating disorder. I was self harming at the time, um, depressive thoughts, and diabetes. And I, this is no no blame at all. But I think the mental health professionals kind of went. Okay, tick, 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 anorexia, self-harm, depression, diabetes. Oh, I'm not too sure about that. Let's deal with these ones first. Mm -hmm. And I think they were, they were also effectively, I think, having to deal with immediate risk to life. And they saw the self-harm as that, and they saw the, the, the eating disorder as that. And I think the, the diabetes is a bit nebulous, or it's a bit um, murky water, so they're not quite sure about how to, how to treat that. When actually, so, so I spent many, many years receiving help and, and therapy for the depression, the eating disorder, and those, those things, but not the diabetes. And actually, I think if they were treated hand in hand, or they saw that actually the, the diabetes served as the bedrock for the, the, event, the, the resulting issues, uh, it might have been solved, or it could have been tackled a bit more yeah. effectively. Quicker, yeah. You say you say because of the diabetes. What you mean is your relationship with your diabetes. Yes. You know, um, and so do you. Shall we stop there for a, 
a minute and then introduce Marietta and then we can come back to some of the points that you've made through the chat function. Absolutely. Thank you Marietta for um, listening and waiting and I know that you'll be very interested in what Lawrence has been saying because mm. it's your pet topic. Um, but perhaps if I just start a little bit by you, you telling us a little bit about yourself, like where did you study medicine, how long have you been a doctor and, um, and how did you get into diabetes? Yeah. Just to, to interrupt quickly, I'm very okay. sorry, um, okay. but we have a few poll questions for the audience to answer um, while we go through the last of the webinar. Um, so I'm just going to pop them up. They should appear on your screen. There's four questions, so we can um, review those quickly at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence, thank you very much for sharing your story today um, with us. I was really listening closely and I'm, I'm, I'm at least um, you've got a lot of time to tell it because um, my, my bit will be a bit more boring. <laughs> um, so yeah, how did I go into diabetes training? Uh, probably quite early on in med school, like in my third year, I joined a research group because I was really intrigued how it all works, how the metabolism works. And there was this one hormone sitting at the middle of it all, regulating it all, and that was insulin. Mm -hmm. And so that work, I I had lots of chats of people living with diabetes who were all my age, med school colleagues, taking part in research. Um, and I thought, well, that's somehow what I'd like to do in the future. And then I went on to train in genital medicine um, in Vienna at a department that had quite a few elements under one roof. So intensive care and kidney and diabetes care and genital medicine. So I would encounter people living with diabetes in all different stages of that journey um, and I had excellent teachers from early on and they some of whom were wearing white coats and some of whom weren't um, got to spend quite a bit of time with people who were living with a pancreas transplant and to taught me the whole life story so I um, it was an early eye-opener to the sort of psychological aspects and of living with diabetes and yeah moving on from there I moved to the UK and I'm um, very pleased and um, feel very privileged that I could join the King's team. Yeah, that's lovely. That's really interesting. I love what you said about that one hormone sitting there. That's exactly what I think about diabetes and insulin is, is that it's such a important and powerful condition because it has ramifications on all organs, doesn't mm. it? Barrett, just picked up that you studied in Vienna, you know, my favourite city because Freud is my favourite psychiatrist. Mm. And so what brought you to England and, and settling here? So, yeah, one of these things, um, if you're open-minded in life, one thing leads to another. And you, yeah. <laughs> so basically through a half year EU funded research fellowship, um, I then sort of, yeah, stayed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very pleased to have you. So um, tell us a bit about how you got into eating disorders. You mentioned mm. that you mentioned something else in your training, you noticed some people wearing white coats and other people not. What does what did you mean by that? What was that? I meant that uh, my, my, my mentors and teachers and people teaching me about how to deliver good diabetes care were mostly people living with diabetes sharing their experience with me. And I felt like oh, an information not, Yeah, that, that, I felt like white coats. Yeah, I was a bit like a information breaker. <laughs> so sharing tips and tricks. Um, I've learned from service years is about, I don't know how you manage your diabetes around professional ice hockey training. And I would share that with the next person who was a professional skier who asked me how they would deal with um, endurance exercise and that. So, so, so I very much benefit and also from obviously my professional mentors, um, because Austria has got not only the psychiatry tradition, but also a big tradition in diabetes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still a patriot. <laughs> okay, so how did you get into eating disorders? Tell us a bit about that. Um, so you're, one of the few, you're one of the few diabetologists in the country that's specializing in this area. Um, again, open-mindedness and asking questions. So um, in a way, um, I was very much on board of that technology revolution when it all started 10 years ago when we had the pumps and the sensors and I thought it was really exciting it's going to resolve all the troubles it will be so much easier and then now that we have it available I realized there's a group of well it doesn't resolve all problems there is something else there which basically came to surface with having the technology available and suddenly seeing downloads and realizing 
the other things going on. And then obviously working at King's uh, where you, Kalida, um, have been working on opening our eyes to these aspects of um, diabetes care all of the time. So you found somebody who um, picked up that question and wanted to learn more about it um, because it is a difficult dual condition because one condition feeds into the other as, as Lawrence very um, beautifully explained how the insulin, you, you called it, you weaponized the diabetes and it was a magic tool. And indeed this is what the hormone insulin and, and, and it is very difficult to see one condition without the other. And, and that not only applies to us diabetes health professionals needing to learn about mental health and understanding what thinking process and feeling and thoughts process are going on, but also the other round trying to understand the physiology of it. Mm. Um, why? Because you said about, you know, throwing around the glucometer when hypo. Well, we know that is a, it's a physiological reaction also to a brain that doesn't quite see as much sugar as it should. Um, we then have unfiltered emotions. And that's a thing we learned in research. Um, but no, it's not one's, only one's own emotion, emotional control, it's really the, the body that is driving that response and vice versa. So it is very much intertwined. And yeah. You've touched out quite a few points there. I think that one of the first points I thought was interesting is, is really, I think what you and Lawrence are referring to, which is the elephant in the room, you know, Lawrence, you were saying my HB once he was going up and up and up and nobody really noticed until the, one of the health professionals did mm. and then tried a very medical approach, which you just nodded, nodded your way out of. And that was the elephant in the room. It was really obvious that you weren't looking after your diabetes, but mm. nobody was saying anything until eventually the penny drops and you're getting a bit desperate. So I think there's the elephant in the room point. Um, I thought what was also... Um, important about what you were saying, uh, Marietta, is, is that, you know, the, the, the brain has got the mind, which is your feelings towards the diabetes, but it's also an organ mm. that reacts to high and low glucose levels in a very organ sort of way, you know, in a very bodily way. So that's really helpful. I mean, you've now been, tell us a little bit about your research, because you've got a, you know, you, you've got a very prestigious NIHR Clinical Scientist Fellowship. Could you tell us a little bit about this fellowship and what your project is and what you're hoping to achieve and how far you've got sorry that's a lot of questions <laughs> well I love talking about it Kalida thank you <laughs> no um um to say uh, a project where we are trying as a team and the team is healthcare professionals from disciplines that, who need to be involved in this is mental health and diabetes and people with lived experience co-designing a complex intervention to support people living with diabetes and eating disorders to help them get into a sort of safe zone of recovery. Um, and so we've done a two years stint of qualitative work of interviewing people living with the condition and also people who say actually don't feel they have an eating disorder but there are elements that are just part of their diabetes self-care that may make some of healthcare professionals think or themselves think well do you have an eating disorder or not so it's a, quite a blurry mm. line of, of um, um, thinking patterns that actually can keep you quite safe with diabetes but then if they go a bit more on the extreme ends they can drive somebody into a very restrictive pattern of an eating disorder so it's a very unknown condition and there are very many types and, and and aspects to it and then there's some so, so the first phase is really trying to understand it more through talking to people in a more structured way and talking to health professionals where do they struggle why do they feel they can't deliver the care they wish to where, where are the problems and we have now designed a toolkit um, that will be delivered by um, our diabetes nurse Jenny Brown who is also now a trained CBT psychotherapist um, in a sessional model to see if we can help people stabilize with the condition and um, feel healthier with it and live more safely. So what you're saying is, is partly what you're saying is, is that we, we you, what you're saying is that you've spent quite a bit of time talking to people with diabetes mm -hmm. like Lawrence and lots of other people and trying to identify the, the subtypes, the way people present with eating yeah. disorders in diabetes. Because as you say, some of it is 
emitting insulin. Some of it is, as Lauren says, I didn't even know I had an eating disorder. I was just exercising a lot and not taking mm. insulin. Trying to characterize the different groups because we need to have the different groups in order to then look for them, mm. you yeah. know. Uh, because when you're struggling, like you were, Lawrence, it's really hard to ask for help, isn't it? Especially when you're a young person um, and really probably quite down. It's really hard to say, please, I'm struggling. Um, so what would you, you know, coming back to um, your work and the other point that I thought Lawrence made, and I'd be really interested in those people that are listening also to answer this question, really, is do you think that, eating disorders in diabetes is a unique condition in its own right? Or do you think it lives within the family of eating disorders? Um, you know, thinking about what Lawrence has said, what your own research has shown, and also everybody who's listening, please reply to the chat question because we, we, we're we all, this is a very controversial question. Mm. So I'd be very interested in what, what the collective thinks. But Marius, I'm asking you. Okay, <laughs> I thought we were waiting for the poll outcome. What no, no, no. Um, I do think it's a condition of its own right, because I think to just, um, because it's very much, it's not only about food and eating, it is also about um, having to be one's own pancreas and what type of, um, when Lauren's talked about this sudden having this responsibility of managing this all and suddenly having this tool that is insulin, that is in your hands. It sort of widens the spectrums of um, things that can happen in the context of disordered eating or um, in type one diabetes that is very unique. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a condition of its own. How do we call it? Is it an ever ongoing discussion? Do we want the word, word eating in it or do we not? Um, because for some people um, about not yeah. taking their insulin rather than not eating. I think there's a, apologize for that, Marietta. There's a bit of an internet dysfunction there. Oh, sorry. Um, didn't quite catch your last sentence. I said the ever, uh, the discussion is doing, so is it an eat? No, it's, it's an, it's an own entity, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But Thank do we you. need eating disorder in that title or not? To, mm. so we so we need to define it quite clearly and this is something that yeah. emma is working on in her yeah. phd yeah um and it has to be a consensus with people mm. with diabetes doesn't it there's a sort of a cultural aspect to what the term is because it does does wind some people up if we don't use the right term and and so on so i think that'd be really useful and i'd like to um turn to emma who is going to give some we're going to stop there marriage and turn to mm. emma too, who's going to read out some of the chat chat the questions on the chat function Thank you, Emma. Hello, hi. Uh, first, shall we share the results of the poll so that you can discuss this? And then Natalie will take over. There you go, the question. Great, Natalie. Hi. Um, so, the result can everyone see the results on their screen? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so, for question one, have you ever felt bad about your body image because of diabetes? We have a fairly even 50-50 split. Um, so you can definitely see that um, diabetes has a really big impact for a lot of people um, on their body image. Um, do you feel pressure to eat a certain way because of diabetes? Many people say yes, 86%. Uh, number three, have you faced pressure from healthcare professionals or other people to have perfect blood sugars or HbA1c at the expense of other aspects of your well-being? Um, most people said no, 67% but there's about a third of people who say that they have faced pressure um, to have the best blood sugars and HbA1c at the expense of well-being. Um, and most people have not been asked by their healthcare professional how they feel about their body image and their diabetes. Um, so I would love to hear um, Kalida, Lawrence and Marietta what you guys think about, about these results. Do you have anything off the top of your head that yeah, you... Um, you Lawrence did you have any were you a bit surprised by these results have, you know, what about have you faced pressure from healthcare professionals to have perfect diabetes control no that that one I, I'm I'm in the no camp there because I think oh, the, the message I've always had is um you, you should try and live with 
manage your diabetes as if you don't have it or, or, or as, as if you know diabetes shouldn't get in the way of other things so you can manage H hba1c as long as you manage your 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 blood sugars effectively uh, so that it shouldn't be having to withhold certain foods or or or, or taking up certain different exercises it's just as um so, so i personally maybe I, I didn't articulate that particularly well but um um question one the, the the 50 well 52 48 split that that surprised me um have you ever felt bad about your body image because of diabetes i i personally i i feel that and i i still don't actually know if i've got the right answer but i feel i've got a little pouches from where i've over injected a bit too much um especially my belly area and it feels i feel incredibly conscious of of, of my, my pouches um, and I was always quick to defend them if anyone ever looked at them or if anyone ever saw them um, and, I, and I think so I've kind of associated and that might be my own personal issue but I've associated the bits of my body that I don't like with diabetes but that's just my own personal. I was surprised by that report as well because I was mm -hmm. expecting more people to say um, that they felt bad about their body image because of diabetes so in a way it's sort of reassuring it's not so bad but also important, as Natalie says, that half of half of people with diabetes do think that it has affected it. So it's an interesting question to keep thinking about, isn't it? And the purposes of these webinars are not to come up with answers, but to create a debate. It's meant to be interactive. Um, and this is new areas and new topics. So we're all learning. Um, so was there any other points, Natalie, that you wanted to make uh, from the polls? Hi. Um, no, I, I think your, your responses are, are really great. And we have a few questions. Um, so I think we can move on to those if everyone's happy with that. Great. Um, so I think um, this question has come up a few times and I think is um, really important and is the experience of a lot of people. Um, so Lawrence mentioned that he didn't really realize at first um, that you, you had an eating disorder. Um, and so one of the questions that has come up is how do I, how do I notice the signs and symptoms? How do I, um, what are the signs that I might have an eating disorder or, or a problem with um, my diabetes and my weight or my insulin? Um, so I think that's a, a question for, for both Lawrence and, and for Marietta. Um, I mean, for me personally, I, I think um, it's, it's almost you have to kind of take yourself out slightly of, of the, the immediacy of the situation. Uh, I personally wasn't my best uh, self-diagnostician -di -diag -di um, uh, because I was so involved in it. But maybe if you uh, imagine uh, uh, if you give the, your symptoms or your behaviours and if your friend was doing that, would you be concerned about your friend's behaviour? And if the answer is yes, then maybe you should... Um, uh, uh, reflect upon that um but um i i think the um just listening to maybe to, to the to that little voice if you're like should i do an injection should i not the fact that you're having to question that um or the fact you're questioning your behaviors um it takes it, it, it's hard it's incredibly difficult to 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 investigate your own your own thoughts about any any particular su subject and um, but it's absolutely worthwhile to do so Thank you. And Marietta, do you have any advice on um, if, if you're not quite sure um, if you have an eating disorder or maybe you're not quite thinking about it in that way, do you have any advice on how to kind of pick up on your own symptoms or, or the, mm. own, the things that you're doing that um, you might be questioning a little bit? Mm. I mean, I can probably say more from the perspective of the diabetology will make me think of it. Uh, and that is, if, if I feel a person has got very good understanding about how to, in theory, look after their condition. Um, and then, as Lauren said, the HPNC goes up and, and, uh, and yeah, 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 I'm doing a meal plan. So, so, so I think always asking that second question, as in, as you said, how and how are you really feeling? Um, and is there anything else that worries you? And um, have you got thoughts about? And then even ask about weight, um, because if somebody isn't concerned about it, they can say, no, it's not an issue, or as a door opener to talk about it. Um, yeah, um, could I add on to that, Natalie? I think it makes, you know, really comes back to Lawrence's point. And I hope you don't mind me bringing it back again, Lawrence. This yeah. is that actually a lot of the eating disorder starts a bit later, is or your the development of it seems to be that there's a an earlier phase of rejecting diabetes. 
and finding the resentment and the hatred towards diabetes. And, and as you said, weaponizing it, not giving insulin as a way of making sense of what is happening, that you've got this condition for life. And I think it sounds like it was a bit afterwards that you thought, oh, not taking insulin, I've lost some weight. Maybe actually, here's another good thing that can come out of diabetes. I mean, there is a phrase, isn't there, that it's one of the best eating disorders to have. I can eat what I like and lose weight at the same time. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so, so I think that's why it's a really good question because I think mm -hmm. it's often mixed with your negative relationship with and your negative emotions towards diabetes. And that's why I think it's an important question to sort of think about and pick. Um, and I think obviously from a HbA1c point of view, or from an increasing weight or low, low, decreasing weight point of view, I think health professionals need to become and are getting more confident about saying, how are you? But also saying, I've noticed that your blood tests aren't going up. This usually means people aren't giving as much insulin as they should be, you know, and just leaving it in the air and allowing mm. the person with diabetes to think about that, you know, can, you know, so. I think it's interesting in, in that, uh, as I said before, before the, the diabetes, it does affect every aspect of your life. So mm. it, there needs to be a, a, perhaps a more holistic approach to, rather than just combating the diabetes, it's like, well, mm. the diabetes plus, 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 mm. like all these other factors. So maybe, and then you can spin those plates a little bit more effectively perhaps. Yeah. It's a really, that's a really good point to, build, to, to add to what I've said. I'm very aware, um, Natalie, that we've only got four minutes, three minutes left, and uh, Emma needs time to actually present our, our this week's toolkit. Yeah, so we can answer a few more of the questions maybe on Twitter yeah. um, and, and post those online for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we have many, many questions. A lot of it has to do with uh, overeating, which I know we do not mention here and binge eating. We promise we can do another webinar on this issue. So about today's um, screen, let me just show you the resources. Can you see my screen? Perfect. So first of all, we'd like to talk to you about Diabetes UK. It has some really nice information about eating disorders. If you just click on the search bar eating disorders, you can find di different information on different types of disordered eating within diabetes. Then we also have the type one resources, which is another great resource. Here you can write again on the search bar inter eating disorders and you can see the DWED, which is the charity for diabetics with eating disorders. They have um, a, a chat uh, and peer support function on Facebook. You can see many other things. I would also like to bring your attention specifically to the BEAT, which is a helpline for eating disorders in general. Um, and it doesn't have specific information for diabetes, but many people still find it very helpful. The BBC Dibolibia documentary with our very own Khalida Ismail, who um, talks uh, about how it is uh, living with disorder eating and diabetes. Um, and it goes in quite a lot of depth on this. If you click on this, uh, you can, on this uh, specific uh, link, it will take you to the YouTube section and then you can see, you can watch it live. Um, and here is the Beat helpline. You can join them via um, a web chat or call. And for males with disordered eating, uh, the Male Voice ED, um, they are again doing uh, helplines and peer support groups um, in your area that are for eating disorders in general, but many people still find them helpful and you can find everything you need here. Everything will be on our Twitter. Um, and you can find all the information there and underneath our video on YouTube. And that's all for me. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. And so that's actually dead on one o'clock. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. It's been a really engaging uh, discussion and conversation. Particularly want to thank you, Lawrence, for being so open and also to Marietta for joining us and telling us about the research that we're doing on it. So thanks, everybody.